Well, first I want to share uh, how we have some divisions on this panel as well. Um, Greg does not believe that there are aliens among us. Did I say that? Oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. But Lisa sure. and Todd do believe that there are aliens among us, so. I live with one. <laughs> I think you might be one. I might actually be one. You might actually be one. So. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, I'm going to start uh, with Lisa. Lisa, welcome to CoLab. We're so happy you're here. Lisa has been in the research and insights game for a long time um, and partnered with many of the world's largest brands. She um, sits in Minneapolis and is uh, EVP um, for market research at Ipsos. Um, she is on the boards of the American Marketing Association and many, uh, there, I mean, I could have filled many index cards with all the boards um, and organizations that Lisa is involved with. She's really passionate about the field and about helping people get into the field and empowering people. Um, she also serves, we, we shared um, some service on the board at the University of Wisconsin for um, Center for Marketing, Marketing Research, Research Excellence. Um, Lisa still serves on that board. I do not anymore, but that's how I met Lisa. Um, and we're just so thrilled that you're here with us today. So thank, thank you, Thank you, Julie. Lisa. And I'll say, Julie was the only UX I researcher was on the in, board. We, yeah, it was the Center for us. Marketing Research. And I was like, let me get in there. <laughs> <laughs> and literally my main message to everybody was like, go meet your user research team <laughs> whenever you get into your big organization. Um, all right, Greg, a People Nerds contributor extraordinaire, um, is, I thought you were in New York, but you were, I just overheard that you're in Michigan. I'm in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't you. Right now you're in Chicago. <laughs> now I'm in Chicago, yes. <laughs> Right. Let's get back to aliens, shall we? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Greg holds a dual MBA and JD from Williams and Mary University. So he brings uh, unique perspectives of deep business knowledge and legal perspective to UXR. He's been at Chase um, for over six years. And he I was going to mention the Cannabis Hawaii mm -hmm. thing, but you beat me to that. Um, at Chase, he is currently the executive director for user experience research for consumer banking. So really excited to have you here as well. And last but not least, Todd McCullough coming to us from the great state of Tennessee. Um, Todd holds an MBA in strategy and marketing from Vanderbilt, where he is now an adjunct professor at the Owen Graduate School of Management. He was the managing director at Doblin, which is where I met him, um, and subsequently monitor for many years. A small stint as the head of marketing for Subway Sandwiches. Ask him about that later. And runs his own um, agency and consulting firm called Ampersand, which um, he has done for years as well. He is also an adjunct professor at the Illinois Institute of Technologies, Institute of Design, where he's recently um, re revived his professorship there and is leading a um, class called Metrics That Matter to graduate students in the field of design. So really excited to assemble this group. And I think I knew Julie as she was starting her illustrious career in user experience research. From the beginning. From the beginning in the last century. <laughs> it, was, it was another century. <laughs> That's true. Thank you so much for pointing that out. <laughs> really appreciate it. So we're going to dig into the, you know, the hot topic, one of the main things that um, came out in our survey and in our discussions that we need to talk about, which is the ROI and the value of our work. It came up this morning already. Um, it's going to always continue to come up in whatever we're talking about, but we're going to really dig into like some really great examples and stories of how um, our panel has addressed that. And we'll start with Greg. So tell us about um, your team, the unique perspectives that you bring, and how you create business value. We've had some great talks about this. I can't wait for you to share them. Sure. So let's do some context setting first. We all come from different size teams. Uh, for some context setting, at Chase Bank, we have about 140 user experience researchers across the organization. Uh, my team, we have about 15 that report to me that are focused on our consumer banking products, so checking accounts, savings accounts, debit cards, ATMs, et cetera. When you walk into a bank with an octagon on it, chances are my team had something to do with that experience. Uh, and because I work at the largest bank in America, it's hard to find a company that cares more about numbers and profit and metrics. 
but I, I will say, first, you said there was going to be some provocations here and the difference between our panels. Oh, yes. I, I love the folks on that side. I can't <laughs> wait to hear about them. I, I, it's not an us versus them. Right. We've talked Equitable about research is a critical part of our job, too, even yeah. at the largest bank in America. In fact, that's the People Nerds piece that you wrote was, yes. was heavily um, talking about that. So yeah. Yes, it, it yeah. was focused on how we do equitable research at Chase and, and um, yeah. inclusive research practices. Uh, I, I lead our uh, legal research practice, which is kind of like an internal um, ethics review board for our research and, and risk council. Uh, but all that to say, we, we care deeply about metrics uh, and numbers and how do we quantify the value of our work. There are a number of different ways that, that we measure impact, uh, obviously impact to our customer, impact to our product, but also impact to our process and impact to our people internally. Uh, those, are, those are kind of the ways that I think about impact. Uh, and my big provocation and challenge to all of you is to not just think about research as a way to build brand new amazing ideas, but also to think about yourself as a risk mitigation tool and a risk mitigation part of the organization. This is critical for me and my team and, and everybody at Chase as we think about talking about the value of our work. Uh, we have nothing but ideas at Chase. We have 250,000 employees, and so we have billions of ideas to choose from every year. Our senior leaders, uh, especially on the product side, will say over and over again, the things I say no to are more important than the things that I say yes to because of how many ideas that we have. So a lot of the value of our work is about helping to try and figure out what things should we say no to? How do we identify additional risks to the business additional risks to the customer, additional risks to researchers and employees. Uh, and, and that is something that you can quantify, and I'm sure we'll get into that later. Well, I mean, yeah, we'd love to hear about that. Actually, like, I, I think about, I had some projects in my history, too, where saying no was, like, the huge value that I provided. But then looking back and trying to get another job, I was like, how do I talk about the value of that, right? Like, yeah. it's kind of an invisible thing to say no. Things disappear. Like, how do you? Sure. I, we talked um, earlier on, on the earlier panel about like making sure people understand the impact that you had. So, how do you talk about that with execs and uh, stuff? Yeah, great question. So, there are two different ways that I talk about the impact of saying no. Um, first, there are projects that we shelve, right? So, we will do work and we'll say we should not move forward with this thing. That's a really easy thing to quantify. Uh, one example, I can't talk about the actual thing that we shut down, because who knows, maybe it'll come back again. But last year, we were considering producing a new product, and we wanted to test that in the branches. To pilot something in the branches across you know, 20, 30 branches or so would have cost us 10 to $15 million to do. And we know how much it costs to do that. right? We have a lot of historical data about how much these things cost. Mm -hmm. We had to price it out for finance. Well, instead of spending a quarter or two quarters, right? Instead of spending six months and $15 million to find out this thing was a bad idea, we spent six weeks and ten dollars to $15,000, probably, sending people out into the field, doing the research that you all are very well equipped to do, to come back and say, this is, this is no good. We should, is, please don't do this. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was honestly copy-paste ten fifteen million $15 million from a financial spreadsheet into my end-of-year performance review. Like, at that moment, we saved the company $15 million this year from this one project because we prevented them from doing something that would have been expensive and catastrophic and would have caused customer confusion. So that's one really easy way to quantify saying no. Uh, the second way is by, by bringing forward the projects that you said yes to. Right? So every time you say no to something, it's because you're saying yes to other things. It's about prioritization. And so we do a really, this is something my manager uh, is really hammers home. Uh, she's the chief design officer for the consumer bank, holistically. And we are very explicit about laying out, here are the projects that we're doing and the value to the business. And here are the projects that we're not doing and the potential value to the business, right? So this is what you're leaving on the floor. But if we did these things that we're saying no to, we can't do all of the things that we've said yes to. So now you're, you're risking sacrificing the value of these high priority, high value projects. Mm -hmm. And you have to, to the last panel, you have to take credit for that as research. You're part of the team that contributes to these decisions. You might not be the person who ultimately decides yes or no, mm -hmm. but you're part of that team and therefore you have to own that decision and you get to own that value as well. Um, so it's not just about generating revenue, it's, a, it's about cutting down expenses, saving money and understanding 
how your prioritized book of work contributes to um, to the value that you create. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear from the rest of the group over the course of the afternoon, like other ways that people are doing this and kind of thinking about that kind of bottom line impact. And there's so many ways to think about impact. We've already touched on some of them over the course of the day. And I have more questions for you, but I want to move over to Lisa and ask her, um, as, as a market research professional, um, I always tell myself that market research does a better job of this than user research, right? That um, at like delivering the, the message of how insights um, result in impact. I don't know, is that, tr is that true or not? Do you feel like that's market research is better at that? And if so, why? I mean, I think there are areas where it's really easy in market research with quantitative data to show impact. Some of the work that we do is designed to have to showcase the financial impact. For example, if we're doing a marketing mix modeling study or a volume forecasting study, there's very specific dollars that are the finding from that work. And mm -hmm. so it's easy to prove the value of the work. Where it becomes more difficult is when we're working on something strategic, like nuances associated with a brand or something that won't come to fruition until years in the future with innovation. Then it becomes a lot trickier. But I love the notion of what do you say no to? And I think that there's communication that all of us could get better on up front with our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You know, what if we do no research? And what will happen? What will mm -hmm. you do? Will our research make a difference in that path? Sometimes not, right? Sometimes they just want to validate what they're going to do anyway. I also love the idea of tracking. I mean, you can keep, even though it's not the nature perhaps of some in the room, you can keep a spreadsheet of the work that you do was the advice from that work taken and what was the financial impact. Mm -hmm. Also, I'd say really listen to what your CEO is saying and in investor calls. <laughs> whatever those words are, whatever he or she is articulating matters. Try to tie your work back to that and don't make it clever. Use the words that were used in those calls because then there's a really easy way to see that you're adding value or having an impact. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So, how do you um, how do you advise your clients to ensure impact? Like, I know you work with a lot of really huge brands, and you've told us a little bit about the roundtables that you do. Like, tell us a little bit about that. We do. We host roundtables. Um, I think we have about six of them in place right now, and there's about ten insights leaders from various companies on each of them, and we talk about how to make an impact a lot. And some accounts say, hey, we aren't asked. Our management trusts us so much that um, we don't feel like we have to come with a dollar amount. I would argue leadership can change. And having that dollar amount in your pocket, even if you don't need to share it frequently, is in your best interest. Um, but some people measure it in different ways. Some measure it by you know, looking at data in the broader universe, like the McKinsey study that shows that design-driven companies have, I think it's 23% stronger revenue and 56% stronger shareholder um, value. I mean, just being able to throw things like that out catches attention. Mm -hmm. Some say, hey, every time the work that we do is mentioned by the CEO publicly, that's a green check mark for us. And so it really varies from company to company. Yeah. Something you touched on that kind of relates to the conversations we were having this morning, especially at Table 11, shout out. Um, was like strategic foundational work is seen as like the sexier kind of work, the more appealing kind of work that researchers want to do. Um, but it's harder to demonstrate the impact of that, whereas the stuff that's kind of down the line, more on delivery side, um, is seen as maybe like, oh, you know, that's for junior people or whatever, not as sexy, but that's where we're really you know, able to demonstrate like the business impact that, that we have. So I think that's maybe something we can think about and like I don't flip. Agree. Hmm? I don't agree. Oh, good. Yeah. Tell me why. I think it's the opposite. Oh, say more. Yeah, I think that the the larger your work, the more strategic it is, the the more impact it likely has on the bottom line, whether you're saving expenses or generating revenue. In the if examples that you shared, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm, right, fair. Not So maybe not for everybody, but for a usability study, it is often very difficult to 
take that and turn it into an exact revenue. I mean, oh, maybe you we got to get Kevin involved in this conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, because I think I you, can, what, you can, coming from LinkedIn, it was more like metrics, right? Like when you're doing usability, you can see like you fixed a thing, you made it easier to use, the metrics are better, the revenue is better. That was like an easier line to draw. Yeah. Whereas we're, if we were doing a project that was like, let's learn about job seekers, for example, that was like really important information and it had a lot of impact on people, but it was harder to say like, it directly tied to this thing that we're doing. So I don't know. I think it's contextual and maybe. I, some I think that's fair. And I, and I think maybe with some of the strategic projects, you might not always be looking at, well, we produced $7 million more revenue, but we introduced a new product or we introduced yeah. a new yeah. feature and, yeah. and we're going to measure that over time. Well, thank you for challenging my orthodoxy. I appreciate that. <laughs> Keep it up. All right, Todd, let's turn to you. Um, you spend a lot of time like thinking about how design speaks to business and business speaks to design and you know so many questions for you about that. I know you've learned a lot. What do you think are like the biggest hurdles for design or user research um, as you've been hearing us talk about it to speak business? Like where do we get hung up? Yeah, I guess <clears throat> I'll start by giving the disclaimer that I think I'm probably one of the least informed people today about what's been going on in user experience research of late, which also causes two good things for me. One, I've probably learned more than just about anybody between last night and today, number one. And number two, I'm also, um, though likely to maybe say things that are uh, uninformed or ignorant in some ways about the reality that you're in, I would invite you to also use that as an opportunity to actually ask those questions. Maybe there are some orthodoxies that I'll challenge that you wouldn't ask if you really knew a whole lot about user experience research. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the setup that I'll give, um, which basically allows me to say anything I want. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> I guess the first thing I would say is, and I, so I ran Doblin for a decade, met Julie and Steph and, and met many others uh, in the room during those years. Um, so I've been around user research for, you know, 25 plus years. So I know about it, but I don't really know this history that you went through today so well. And so this, the current state is, is kind of new to me. Um, I'm really not tuned into that very much. But if I step back and think about um, communicating the value to the business, I would take the viewpoint as leaders. So it's a perfect audience for this. You, you guys are the ones in the driver's seat for your organization as it relates to user experience research. And I think it's this group of folks who could say, hey, let's, look, let's zoom up and down the organization at all the different levels from a project team, a product, uh, a platform, um, a uh, maybe a category, um, a, a business within the business, and then the executive team. Think about all those different levels and try to understand what are they dealing with? What are the things that they are challenged with? What, what are their pain points? Kind of use them like they were your users. Steph mentioned earlier, she wanted to get to know engineers, so she learned a lot more about engineering. Well, guess what? If you really want to appeal to the value at the different levels of the business, learn about those levels of the business, especially as the leaders. Talk to those people. Find a person, so a lot of this come up late, lately is it's not so much about the, the role as the person. Find the person that could be your partner. Find the person that could be your sponsor that can help you, number one, connect to those groups, and number two, learn about them. Learn more about those groups. So zooming up, zooming down across the organization, and then basically having a mission for your team that says, we want to have the most impact we can have on this company. We do things already that we do well. Maybe we don't get as much credit for them as we should in other parts of the business because the other parts of the business don't even see it. They're not exposed to it. It's not in their everyday world. But I would argue, if we're people nerds, I've been in those executive rooms for 25 years, coaching CEOs and being a senior executives of large companies. Guess what? They don't just care about money. It's not just about the money. And a lot of the things they care about are people things. They really care, care about their customers. They really care about their employees. They really care about that CFO that's a pain in the rear end that can't get out of the 1980s. They, they really care about getting current on what's going on in the world. 
And I think the capabilities that we bring to the table could be applied amazingly, even at that level. I think, um, was it um, Karin? Carl? Carl, from the previous one, the, uh, from IBM, is he here? Mm -hmm. Several times when he was talking, I was nodding my head. Uh, yes, yes, yes. He said things like, I have an executive newsletter that goes to the executives that talks about issues. Um, could we find a way to get in the door to have updates at that level? Because trust me, here's the other thing about that executive boardroom or the uh, executive team. It is so, I'm going to use the word imperfect. It's unbelievable. The stuff that goes on in those rooms. They are clueless about so many things. And it's not because they're dumb. But they're not utilizing the school, the, the, the capabilities across the organization in that room. And decisions get made based on biases that an individual has that they brought from another company from two decades ago. So if we could do a much better job of saying, you know what? In this room, we're going to be responsible for our company's understanding of the customer, for our company's understanding of the experience, for our company's alignment around the situation that we're in. Let's take that approach. Let's say that's a part of our mission as a group. And oh yeah, we're going to do some great research on projects that inform new product development, but we're also going to figure out what's going on at the top, and then maybe we team up with other groups in the organization to solve the problems at each of those levels, zooming up and zooming down. Well, and I'd like to add something to that. In terms of promoting your personal brand and the brand of your team, I think in both Insights and UX, if you think about a soccer team, there's defenders and there's strikers. I think we're defenders most of the time. We wait until work comes to us and then we respond or we say no, rather than being strikers and saying, hey, here's an issue that I know matters. I or my team are going to take this forward. We're going to be the ones to present it to the leadership team. There's, we're not going to have a, a middleman. Think about that too. Is there even just once a year a time where you can be the striker? I yep. think feeds into what you're saying. Perfect. I love it. We have to move on to our next panel, but Graham, there was a football reference for you. So, yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll get back to kind of some cross panel talk in a moment, but I want to um, thrilled to introduce um, our doing it right, doing it well panel, um, who are also divided on aliens, as it turns out. Um, Alba is a yes. Aliens are among us. Um, I grew up on the X Files. Like it was the one show that my father allowed me to stay past up uh, past bedtime to watch with him. So same. Huge yeah. Champ. You sure. Yeah, you can't deny it. Although Jonathan is not convinced. So yeah, which is weird because I'm actually a huge sci-fi fan, uh -huh. but. If any of you have heard of the dark forest hypothesis, we can talk about it. Oh, yeah. Later. Well, Adam, yeah. where are you? We'll be discussing this later. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so I am thrilled to welcome two people nerds um, to the panel today. Um, Alba joins us from Boston. Thank you for traveling out here. Um, she has an academic background in sociology from Swarthmore College and um, speaks and writes extensively um, on matters that um, that involve uh, social justice, racial justice, equity, um, fairness, and safety. Um, she is currently a partner at Humanity Centered. Um, if you aren't familiar with this organization, I highly recommend um, that you sign up for their content and their webinars um, as immediately, like right now. Um, they are really helping us to, to challenge and transform um, human-centered design practices, and I'm very grateful for you and your team's work. Um, she's currently an independent researcher um, focused on work with domestic violence, refugees, and healthcare organizations. So, Alba, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, and we have Jonathan joining us from L.A., obviously. <laughs> You're looking great. <laughs> Wait, is there, oh, I guess compared to the Midwest. Exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. Wasn't You're stepping it up. This <laughs> um, <Shots> Jonathan, <laughs> what's that? Shots fired. <laughs> well, I love your sweater. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jonathan holds a master's in international development from the London School of Economics, um, worked for the US government for years um, in analytics and user experience research, and then pivoted to the private sector. He is now senior manager of design research for Headspace. Um, so thank you both for being here as well. 
Alba, I'm going to start with you. I'm so excited to hear your perspective. Um, I, I think Greg kind of teed it up nicely, like these things are not in diametric opposition to each other, right? Like um, ethics and inclusion and, and diversity in our practice aren't in in opposition of ROI and value. So, um, but before we get to that, tell us a little bit about Humanity Centered and how Humanity Centered supports user researchers to do the kind of personal work that supports the professional work. Well, I think that's actually kind of the provocation that I wanted to start off with. Great. I think, um, you know, for an industry that prides itself for being so human centered, we often don't focus on those foundational social and psychological skills that we need in mm -hmm. order to really do our best professional work. You know, I think we need to kind of contextualize what does it mean to be a user researcher in 2023, right? Mm -hmm. Like many of us have experienced mass layoffs, or if we have survived a reorg, we're now uh, understaffed and overscheduled. Uh, we are the people who are advocating for ethical best practices for organizations that are often really resistant towards that. We're always trying to advocate for the value of our job. We have to hold space for participants who are often sharing really difficult stories with us about how they are struggling with our products or even just what is going on in their world outside of our product. And on top of that, we are individually and as a society experiencing the long-term impact of COVID-19, war, climate change, systemic racism, and we have to hold all of that as researchers. Mm -hmm. We have to come to our work every day acknowledging that and still being able to function. We are an incredibly overwhelmed and traumatized profession. And so what I think what we really try to do at Humanity Centered is give folks a little bit of relief, right? Mm -hmm. By trying to equip them with the skills, which we often call emotional endurance, right? That's the way that we're able to relate to ourselves and our work as individuals. And then we also try to equip teams with the strategies and practices to create what we call systems of care. Right, the ability to still function and maybe even possibly thrive despite all of the things that are going on around us. Mm -hmm. So we always try to divide it like that, emotional endurance and systems of care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, um, I think I've, I've personally benefited from the programming um, and coaching that I've gotten from you um, and Vivian, but you know, at an organizational level, you, you work with a lot of people from a lot of organizations, um, some of the biggest organizations. How do you think at a, at a systemic or organizational level to help people make time for this, to help research teams, research leaders, but also um, across, across the organization to, to recognize the importance of this and create space for it? Yeah, I think um, kind of like Greg, we often talk about the significance of loss when we're trying to advocate for the value of this type of work, right? You know, what we have been observing when we're going into all of these different organizations that are across different uh, disciplines and industries, that, you know, researchers are leaving because of burnout. They are having lower productivity. They are not performing as well as they should, right? And so there is an HR <laughs> loss within these organizations that we can actually quantify really well. And I think something that we're also starting to recognize patterns in is that we are losing a lot of very um, talented, experienced researchers. I think they are one of the fastest uh, growing groups that are leaving the industry because they have been forced to um, not only be overworked and all of that, but I think that they're feeling a sort of what we call moral injury, right? Like they're working on work that doesn't satisfy their personal values and goes against their ethics. And so they're leaving mm -hmm. our industry. So not only are we wasting money as organizations losing employees, but we're also losing a lot of organizational knowledge mentorship, and those are all things that we can eventually quantify. Yeah, I'm curious, just show of hands, who's experienced what I was talking about on your teams and your organizations? Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to Jonathan for a moment, um, and then we'll 
hopefully have some talk among the panel, but when we talk about impactful research, we often like think about the business side of that, right? Um, but our work impacts the people that we engage with. How does that kind of show up in your work at Headspace? I know it's, a, it's kind of a unique situation. Yeah, and um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Headspace is a like mindfulness and meditation platform, but has also grown. We now are beginning to offer like therapy and coaching as well. So, um, in my time there, you know, we've been researching you know mental health and well-being you know before and then during COVID and kind of watching that shift and transition. And you know, and credit to to Humanity Center for kind of showing up in that moment of need for me personally and then our team as well to think through this. And we've really been thinking about you know, the act of research actually is like an act of care. Like we're engaging in these, you know, obviously like intimate, you know, connected, vulnerable experiences with participants. How are we also caring for them in that moment? So going beyond just rapport building, but what are we doing to actually ensure we aren't, you know, activating them unintentionally? How are we actually using trauma-informed practices to permission when we want to, you know, if they're comfortable going more rather than letting just a business objective of, but well, we need to learn more and answer that and move forward, kind of push us down that lane. And I've been in that position of, of doing that at times. Um, so thinking more about the potential harm we might cause participants as another consideration to layer in uh, around that. I think often we want to go for that emotion in research because it helps with the storytelling. It helps us kind of like, connect with these stakeholders. We've all talked about this morning, we're trying to influence, um, but how can we make sure that, you know, we're not capturing that at the expense of someone else's well-being? At what cost, yeah. And uh, tell us about some specific ways that you've put in, things you put in place to do that, to provide those moments. Yeah, uh, so in a lot of our research at Headspace, we think about not just, you know, safety, uh, you know, transparency and rigor in that, but also, things like pause, rest, joy in the research process. Um, you know, we really wanna layer in these opportunities for our participants if they need to, uh, you know, to, to take those moments to step back. Um, and also you know, for the researchers to set clear boundaries. You know, we have a bunch of care providers and therapists on staff with us and they really helped us also think about, you know, okay, I'm entering this conversation not as a trained clinician, but as a researcher who does care about you and your well-being. So to get tactical, you know, some of the things we do, we set those boundaries right up front with our participants. Um, in you know, moderated studies, I really love using this technique of, uh, that I borrowed from one of my colleagues, Jaren. What, you know, what, what we started an interview with, what brings you joy um, if we know it's gonna go somewhere heavy? And we try to return to that moment at the end to get kind of, give someone the opportunity to end on a high note there around that. Mm -hmm. And then in unmoderated studies, we'll often introduce these you know, moments of meditation, moments of pause, or even just multimodal opportunities to share feedback. So you know, if we're asking about stress and anxiety, we say, you know, do you wanna submit a photo? Do you wanna submit a video? Do you wanna just talk to us about it? Or do you even wanna submit a drawing? We do a lot of drawing in our research in mental health and well-being because we found it allows participants to communicate often safely and in a different way and allows us to gather artifacts and understanding uh, through those means. Yeah, and and um, I think you mentioned too that sometimes you create like moments of escape, like an escape valve for participants of like, if you, you can, you can, you don't have to complete this study if it's too much for you or if you're feeling a certain way. Totally, yeah, we've had participants enter in and you know, like life happens, right? You know, and so I think giving that option to feel like you can you can go and that's okay, and you know the study is not the most important thing in you know, Wait, their what? life. Yeah, <laughs> that confuses me. All right, I'm gonna allow a little crosstalk. I'm curious if there's any reaction to kind of what Alba and, and Jonathan were saying from. I mean, we were looking at each other and nodding about that notion of happy place and then coming back to that happy place if you're talking about something deep I think that's brilliant and, and I really love loved hearing that but I can't say that I mean I'd have to ask my team but I can't say that I've heard of us practicing that so I'm going to suggest that thanks for that I, yeah. I've not done that either I, I think that's something I'm going to take back to, to my team obviously we're talking about financial health a lot of the times something that we, we know is very personal to folks creates a lot of emotion uh, and, and especially when we are doing that with people who are struggling day to day, and this is such a yeah. high touch 
high emotion topic. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I'm going to incorporate that tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, just to, to, I know we're a little bit over time, but um, we'll indulge in a couple more questions here. Um, often the we're asked to move really quickly and we're asked to tie to the bottom line and make money, um, but that kind of comes at the expense of some of the like, um, the ethical approaches and inclusive approaches, which also take a little bit more time. So, and you know, excludes people at the margins or people who have been historically disadvantaged. Um, what is our responsibility in this as, as UXRs, as UXR leaders to kind of walk that line between um, making money and creating systems of care? Which I don't know that they are diametrically opposed. I throw that out there as if they are, but tell me how you feel. This is where I'm learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not my area. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a possible perspective to share here that I've been reflecting on, which is, I feel like, I want to believe they're not diametrically opposed. Like, I actually feel a lot of synergy across this, and like, these are, you know, you're talking about layering additional, like, you know, tracking steps, right? To to prove, you know, to quantify, you know, and we're talking about layering in practices that, you know we need to do this right. So it's all about laying those in. I think where I do see a tension, a real tension that I think is, is really tricky to resolve here is like, ultimately I see making money as a, it feels the nature of a, like a zero sum competitive act in the end, right? Because there is a market to be captured and there is one that will get it over. I think for us to be successful in this work, there has to be more, and you were saying this to me this morning, so I'd love to hear your perspective. There has to be more of a spirit of like, collective action and like cooperation across us as like research and you know leaders and representatives of these voices in our companies and I'm not sure those two can quite coexist I don't know so I actually want to share a story of a, of a colleague of mine. Um, so she does uh, enterprise uh, research and she did a really interesting project where um, she was talking with like frontline workers but she used focus groups rather than interviews, which I thought was kind of like an interesting thing because we usually are always critiquing focus groups because they're very biased mm -hmm. and this. But she told me that the reason why she chose that method is because she got all of these people who are normally never in the same room mm -hmm. to be in the same room and therefore they were able to hear each other's pain points, their stories. They found ways that they were more similar than different and then that actually activated collective action in that organization, they started a union within there. Now, we can't all do that in our organizations, but I thought that that was like a real spark of imagination mm -hmm. um, in a way of sometimes we don't have to be an advocate for the user. Sometimes we just have to create the conditions in which users can advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a, a halfway point where yeah, maybe we aren't able to tie it to the business, but we can inspire people who do have mm. impact over the business, which I think, was the frontline workers in this case. I think that's so powerful. And Todd, you were saying you don't have much to contribute, but actually something that you said earlier about the people in the C-suite at the executive level, they care about more than money. They care about people. They care about people problems. Um, so I, mean, I think- I'm sorry, but I'm gonna interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> because secondarily, I think they care about those things. But if they aren't providing value to shareholders, they're not going to be around very long. And so mm -hmm. it's money in the end in most cases. And I wish that wasn't true. I'd love, love to hear a comment. Yeah, so I would argue that the best leaders realize that focusing on shareholders, customers, stakeholders, users, partners, that's And the CFO health of their, health of their is people. Is how they get the numbers. Yeah, I think the central thesis, right, and, and I would hope that many people in this room agree, the idea is if we create better experiences for our customers, if we, uh, you know, in, in my instance, if we're working with individuals who are struggling day to day with their finances and we create and we help them live a more financially healthy lifestyle, that is helpful in the long term to the bottom line of the business. And, and, and so these, you know, the caring about people, the caring about the experience is for the benefit yeah, of, the generosity in the pursuit of making money. But I, I don't think that's, to me, and maybe this is because I'm uh, an MBA and, and a recovering attorney, um, that I don't think it's bad to have both of those 
sentiments in in the mind of, of for yourself, for your team, That's a good and point. for executives. It, it is for me. Uh, fine to say, look, our, my goal is to make these experiences better for customers, to make their lives better. And in doing so, uh, By yes, the way. my Chase yeah. will make more money. Uh, the executives will make more money. I will make money. I, I continue to have a home and be employed. And hopefully these people's lives will improve as a result. Because ultimately, if, if we are creating subpar experiences, if our company ceases to exist, in theory, maybe not for every company, but in theory, that would be bad for people as a whole. Um, yeah, this yeah. is a... Just one more pile on is to say that that's the situation the executives are in, right? They have to produce those numbers. They're put in as context. But I think if you get to know those executives, you'd realize they're not that one-sided. Mm -hmm. There's really a lot more they're there. Humans. They're humans. They're humans. Yeah. I love it. Well, that's a good segue. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, a lot to think and talk about. We're going to just let the, like we did last time, just let the panelists kind of share some of their observations and highlights from the talks that we had. So Lisa, you want to kick us off? Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things at table six that I thought was really interesting was this notion as we started talking about ROI, um, Amrita, if you're in here, she brought up the idea of ROO. Maybe, maybe you could comment on that. Oh my gosh, I thought you were just going to tip right off the stage for a second there. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amrita, uh, and uh, I work for a consulting firm. And so in that context, I was talking about how when clients come to us, sometimes they are always not sure of the kind of work they want to do, need to do. And there's always some conflicts from one stakeholder to the other. So recently on a project with a mission-driven company, we were clearly hearing two distinct things. One was definitely about growing revenue, and the other was something more like a response to their mission objective. You know, like, hey, we really need to be doing this thing. And so we just broke it apart into return on investment work and return on objective or return on mission work. And we outlined it differently, and we gave it different time scales and more depth and thought. And it really helped the way we were able to converse about mm. that. It immediately put it in a different bucket, so it was not competing with the ROI work. And that way, even as it goes up the chains to the CEO and the board, it will remain a distinct uh, way of talking about it. So that's what I shared. I love that. Thank you so much. And then if you don't mind, Julie, I had another from Stephanie who was commenting on the notion of leveraging other departments um, and getting their feedback. Hello. Um, yeah, we were talking actually about doing surveys to other departments to see how we were do how we're performing. Mm -hmm. It was actually a bit my my contribution was a build on that idea. And the idea was, well, what if that's used from human resource point of view of like leverage to let people go? And so we, we were talking about doing department department um, surveys. So you would do a survey with marketing and say, how, how well are we doing mm -hmm. to get that feedback and help align um, measuring what's important to them? Yeah. It's super interesting. Um, I want to touch on what Amrita said for a moment and then come back to that. Um, I've never heard of this idea of return on mission. I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, I'm wondering if anybody else has kind of talked about something like that or heard about something like that. Anybody on the panel? Like, Alba, is that something that you've heard about? There was a Table 5 common com conversation about should we tie back to our values Mm -hmm. which is sort of getting. It's not just tying yeah. back to it, though. It's like really demonstrating, like, here's how we measurably contributed to that, yeah. um, which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah. They're very cool. We've tried to think about it a little bit at Headspace of, like, you know, kind of different levels of, of impact or influence and, like, what are the things we might – this isn't just my team. This is more a strategic planning process, but, like, 
what are the ways we might measure, you know, not just shareholder value, but also like employee value, value for our members, value in the world. So kind of tying it. And actually, um, Beth from Table 7 kind of had a build on that framework. If you might want to share a bit more about this sort of mission innovation, uh, metrics for innovation that you were speaking about that kind of ties together some of these pieces. Yeah, I have to give some credit to Todd for being part of how I learned to do metrics for innovation. But um, we were talking about uh, like ethics and part of, it occurs to me that there is a useful way to think of this and part of how we think about quantifying the value and impact and trying to figure out like what are we, what are we doing here with innovation. And the way we do that is saying, well, what are the behaviors and outcomes we're trying to drive? And how do we tell if that's happening? And back into then say, what are the metrics and indicators that tell us that's happening? And so if we're trying to say, how can we ensure we're behaving ethically? We can do the same thing and say, well, how could we, what does it look like when we're behaving ethically? How can we tell if it's happening? And then what would be metrics that we might want to put in place to hold ourselves accountable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love Beth because she actually does the stuff that I talk about doing. <laughs> Go ahead, Todd. Yeah. Um, I had an interesting conversation at the break with Yuran. Is that how I say it? Yes. Um, we were talking about, he was talking about um, a capability that a lot of different disciplines don't learn that would be really helpful and actually turns out to be super important. <laughs> in the being successful. And uh, if you remember what I'm talking about, I won't talk more. I'll just let you talk about it. So that discipline is change management. Um, basically, a lot of us people uh, in, I guess, design and UX research uh, come from, you know, from a background where we know how to do research quite well, but we probably don't know how to do change management. and. Unfortunately, that's the reality that we are facing. We, we need to learn it how, like how to do it on the job. But I think you know, if we could incorporate some of this learning right from the start, we would be much better equipped to, uh, to do a, a much better job than what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And do you do that at RBC? Is that kind of a thing that you're? Um, no. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, the answer is no. It's just an aha moment that I had mm -hmm. probably like in the past few weeks or a few months. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually did encounter a couple of, uh, been, I guess, a couple of people in other organizations that I guess are ahead of the curve and, and are learning how to do this to be able to get to the next level. Um, so. Yeah, just, just a thought, pretty mm -hmm, much. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> great. When people ask me what are the toughest things in the space of innovation as a discipline, this broader thing that I focus on a lot, um, the two things I will say are innovation strategy, because I don't think hardly anybody does innovation strategy in a way that, um, in my opinion, is mature. But the other one is change management. It's simply how do we get change to happen in organizations because mm -hmm. innovation always involves risk you know there's resistance how do you help organizations overcome that risk so i think it's it's true across so many disciplines if you're trying to make change happen let's make sure that we're really thoughtful about great methods to do that yeah i mean and it came up earlier today too this idea of change and change management and like we're doing that within organizations. Um, we're doing that um, on our teams, and we're doing that um, as an industry, too. Like, that's what we kind of came here to talk about, is like, what do we need to change? Um, kind of reflecting that back on ourselves, too, that what do we, if we're, if the next level of UXR leadership and in our industry is like helping manage change and helping making decisions, like what skills do we need as leaders to help organizations move through those moments um, in a more effective and efficient way? Um, I think there's something really important about that. Um, are, we, are we equipped to manage the change that not only we're asking people to do within our products or our strategies, but like that we're asking our teams um, to undergo as well? But one of the things that I challenged our group on was um, when you think about the evolution of any industry, you're going to get things that are leading edge, bleeding edge, that a few years later become commoditized. I remember when we first introduced Target to the idea of ethnography, like that's a possibility that you could talk to 
that few people and not hundreds or thousands. And it was absolutely inane. It was asinine that we would think of that, they said, at the time in 2002, 20 years ago. And now look at it, right? Now those things are table stakes. Those things are expected and to some degree commoditized. So how do we think about what's next? A lot of the things I was hearing today sort of assumed what we do, as, as if we all know what we do, and what we do is what we do, and what we do is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we should say is, what should we do? How could we use our capabilities? How could we use our special skills in different ways in organizations? And that's kind of where I was going with going, zooming up and down the organization, looking at different teams. Those teams need the, the skill sets in this room, but in some cases it might be applying them in ways that you're not applying them today. That's, that's a good provocation. Does it spark any thoughts among the group? Maybe calling them different things too. Like, like I wonder if research, like I was reflecting a lot on this morning, like, you know, research influences, it gathers, right? It persuades. It doesn't always create or make you know, or solve, it suggests mm -hmm. sometimes. And I wonder if like, yeah, that, that sort of thinking back to the conversation around roles and relations, like how do, can we can break out of that, but what do we need to let go of to do that potentially? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the words and the language that we use are really important. That's another orthodoxy of mine was like, and people who have been on my teams know that, like I've always been like, let's just call it something obvious, UXR, UER, something like that, um, and is that, really what we should be doing now? Is that the right, do we, are we even calling ourselves the right thing? I'm not the first one to pose this question. Like there are many articles about this right now and lots of um, soul searching around it, but is JM in the room? JM? Oh, he just walked out. He, he um, JM works at um, AT&T as a design strategist and he was kind of saying, well, I, do research a lot, actually use DSCOUT a lot, but like I don't think of myself as a researcher. Like research is something I do a lot of it, but I'm a strategist. Like mm -hmm. that's how people see me and that's what I'm doing in the organization. So people don't see me as a researcher. Um, and he was like, that feels like a very kind of kind of cocky thing to say. Like, and I was like, no, but it's true, and that's something we should all be thinking about. Yeah. Um, Kristen had some comments on language. And oh how we yes. Use it. Yeah, I think that when we were talking about um, reporting back on metrics and the idea that we as researchers or as uh, part of UX function might have the idea that it's um, an intangible that we're going after, right, a bigger idea, um, but it's also good for the business and the business has a different idea about what that outcome looks like, mm -hmm. so we're going to be doing it in ways that work towards that intangible and are helping you know solve a problem and that kind of thing mm -hmm. but we might talk to the business about it in a very numbers based you know kind of um you know quantitative measures mm -hmm. and it's just that idea of storytelling like you know catering the message to kind of the recipient so that they understand it right and you you tied it to last night as well the same idea you don't tell consumers that we're saving the world you tie it to the nostalgia they have with beans, or whatever the case might be. It's back to beans. Yes. Welcome <laughs> back to beans. It's all about the bean. Um, yeah, yeah. Greg, did you have some insights to share? I think you have a little bit of something, maybe a different. Yeah, I have a bit of a different topic. Uh, I think a couple of great conversations with tables three and four. Uh, I will make no comments about which tables are the best, but they know where I stand. Um, we had a great conversation about a couple of topics from earlier today as well around the democratization of research and its intersection with um, safety and risk and compliance and trauma. Um, right? How do we do research that may create risk or create trauma in our participants? And how do we do that while trying to democratize the work that we're doing. Um, Danielle from, from that table, are you around somewhere to speak more? Yes, Danielle, if you could tell us a little bit more of your thoughts. Hi, um, so my thought was basically, even in the research world, we're not fully consistent on making sure that we all know how to talk to users without causing harm. Um, and knowing that we're approaching 
the conversations we're having with people just in a very ethical way. Um, and so we still have a lot to figure out amongst ourselves, let alone to someone who comes to us with absolutely no research background. And if like anyone can learn it, that's not the problem. Like If they're interested in learning, by all means, yes. But there's a huge risk in not, and I don't just mean like reputation risk, I mean like legal risk, ethical risk of letting loose a whole bunch of people or even just one person to talk directly to users without training them on how to do that in a way that's not going to cause harm. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my lawyer hat on here, although first I have to caveat by saying this is not legal advice. <laughs> Uh, fine print. You. Yes, fine print. <laughs> I mean, there is actual liability involved for us to consider, right? If we have any employee going into, for example, doing ethnography work, going into somebody's home, place of business, following them around, there is liability risk. Uh, that employee could physically harm the customer. The customer could physically harm the employee. Uh, someone could slip and fall. And that creates a risk for uh, the company for that researcher as an individual, uh, right? For that person's family, there, there are all of these considerations um, that we need to keep track of mm -hmm. as professionals. And it's important for us as we go into people's homes or we do our work, but gosh, if we're to send people who are just doing it for the first time, uh, I, I mean, think about a lot of folks in this room have worked with undergraduate researchers, for example, right? And the amount of oversight that you have to provide those folks to make sure that they are abiding by best practices, they're being supervised, that doesn't go away just because somebody works at a company now. Uh, and, and in yeah. fact, it might get even more stringent. And, and so that I think it's a really interesting point uh, and one now it's, that I have to bring back to my legal partners. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's back to your, your point earlier about risk mitigation. I mean, I think mm -hmm. um, we need to change the conversation around democratization, right? The, everybody thinks like, oh, researchers don't want people to do research because they're precious about their research and that's just the way they are and they're just kind of a pain that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not the conversation we should be having with our stakeholders. It's about like, there are real things that we need to consider as we do this so that we can um, embrace a culture of user-centeredness and give people access to people and access to insights and, and go on that learning journey together, but like safely for everybody. Alba, I know you have thoughts on this. Oh my God, so many. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let me give you an example. So uh, this past year, 12 months on a one research project, um, we were working with youth in the foster care system, right? So you can imagine this is one of the most vulnerable populations that you could possibly work with. They're underage. They have been removed by the US government from their homes, and now they are placed in either institutions, foster care homes, or with uh, relatives and friends, right? So highly traumatized by a very racist system. Okay, so like that's the context that we're starting with, right? So in this particular project, um, we were trying to democratize, but we were actually trying to democratize in a way that I think is usually very valued in that we try to bring on uh, researchers who actually had experience in the foster care system, right? So this is the ideal, right? Like we want to have our research teams reflect the populations that we're doing research with. The first interview, that we did, not with a youth, but with a mental health professional who was talking about their interactions with youth, they said something that was very offensive about uh, youth and their families who are in the system. And this researcher started to get activated. And you could see it physically, right? Like they're starting to get really red, they're getting very tense, they're not able to focus because they were so angry at what that participant said that they just completely lost sense of where they were. Mm -hmm. And then they said something that was really offensive to the participant, <laughs> basically. And the participant was like, well, because I'm actually your in to get access to other participants, well, now I'm not going to connect you to those other participants. So we actually had to pause the project for several weeks because we no longer had access to that sample. Right, so here's an example of, we have very good intentions of making our research team more inclusive in order to produce better research. So we're democratizing it and 
increasing inclusivity, and yet the people did not have the training on how to do work on their own experience. Mm -hmm. Because I think we often think about, you know, that it's only about people who are doing research on very specific topics that need to be trained on these things, but even doing research on people who have your own experience can be traumatizing in itself. And our teams, the systems that we have in place, the protocols do not reflect diversity and inclusion in that way. So what I always say is that we can't divor divorce equity from trauma-informed practices, and yet we don't ever talk about that in research. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think you raise a good point too, that with democratization of work, uh, all of these situations might arise. Democratization in theory is meant to give us time back to do other work, but gosh, I've not experienced a lot of democratization projects that are easier for me than running the damn project myself, um, right? I, I mean, depending on the complexity of the project, you're talking about setting up the project with that, whoever it is, designer, project manager, or whoever, training them on how to go out into the field and do that work, sending someone out there with them, potentially, mm -hmm. uh, teaching them how to analyze and synthesize the data. I mean, there's more work involved, oftentimes, in helping somebody else learn how to do this, uh, which is not to say we shouldn't do it, right? We, it's great to teach other people how to do this work, um, but it's not, it's, it's really not a time saving method. And we shouldn't think of democratization of research as a way that we are all going to get a bunch of time back to do even cooler work. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a story. I think Elizabeth, it was at table 10, was talking about uh, being forced to do uh, an internal focus group on the same topics that user research was done and the results of that. Is, Elizabeth, is that right, Elizabeth? Did you tell that story? <laughs> So, can you hear me? Oh, good. Yeah, I was working with a um, a company that does uh, peripherals for consumers for tech devices, right? So, think of your, you know, your headphones and things like that. Anything you connect to your to your laptop, and they were very new to user research and ethnographic research, and they weren't ready to go there. Like, let's just start with some focus groups, and so they had their target audience for these focus groups to check out these speakers, and they insisted on this really odd thing. They said, well, we also want to do an internal focus group with, or a focus group with our internal folks, too. And we were kind of like, that's that's crazy. Why would we do a research, you know, a focus group with our internal folks? Like, okay, do it. It was awesome. It was a great, I would recommend everyone do this because, of course, the consumers picked what they wanted, and it was the complete opposite of what the people internally chose. And it was just this clear cut of like, this is why you should do consumer research, because if you only talk to your internal folks, you would build the wrong product. So it was a great experience. I'd have been telling that story for years in the future. I wonder, Ellie, from table six, if you could comment on your internal advisory boards. That's a related topic, I think. Is Ellie here? So similar um, to what you shared, there was a topic that we were, I work at Lululemon and we were exploring a new category and we didn't really have the funding to do outside research. So we decided to leverage our internal employees as an advisory board um, to help um, with that research. And obviously they're internal, so those same things could happen. However, lots of the insights that the group provided were actually not only applicable to that, to their needs, but also our, our target consumer. And I think it just showed our leaders too, the, the importance of speaking to that group. And then we were real, really able to apply some inclusive design based on the, those specific needs to the rest of the target. So super successful and um, really great employee experience for that group because they were able to develop acumen and understand of research and also advocate for the things um, that we were talking about. I'm a big proponent of internal uh, research like this, specifically as a pilot for the external mm -hmm. research. Um, we, we, we do it quite a bit because a lot of our projects are time intensive to set up. They're very expensive. It's difficult to find the right customer sometimes. And so we'll do internal, uh, we will recreate the research as a pilot internally to figure out what do we need to adjust and change as we go external. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it does still, it allows us to compare what our employees say with what our customers, well, which I've are not always know. the same thing. Yeah, because my fear, not fear, well, I guess fear as a company who makes money off 
doing research externally would be that your stakeholders would say, hey, it's so predictive just to talk to ourselves. We don't ever need to talk to anyone but our own people. Yeah, I think, well, first I'll um, acknowledge my own privilege in my organization and that my my organization has bought into the idea that we should do external research at this point, right? As I said, we have 140 UX researchers. This is not a company that says, hey, just talk to a couple employees and that's good enough. Um, we really use this though to make sure that our research is fit for purpose and that it's really valuable. Uh, and it is also an opportunity for our stakeholders to be involved and to observe, to see the work that we're doing, uh, to make any adjustments after the fact. I'm sure we're all very familiar with doing research sessions and having stakeholders show up and say, I don't know, I didn't really like that line of questioning, or I didn't really like what we heard about this, or I wish we explored this topic. Well, doing an internal pilot uh, really gives us that opportunity to adjust on the fly, uh, again, especially for the stuff that is hmm. time intensive or expensive or logistically very difficult. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm going to hand it over. I'm sorry. Alba, why don't you go and then we'll hand it to Jonathan for a couple of his takeaways as well. Well, I just wanted to add that I, this is also kind of like a, an ethical good as well, because mm. when we're doing internal work, we can focus on um, you know, kind of like our core projects. And then when we're actually doing external research, we can actually focus on groups that are historically marginalized or who are usually excluded. And we don't have to focus so much on questions that are often asked of them. So we can avoid over-researching them, re-traumatizing them and all of these things. So there's a, there's an interesting thing here where I think we often think that the most ethical thing is to always talk to users, but I actually think we should mm. be relying a lot more on secondary research. We should be relying a lot more on pilot research mm. so that we can actually target our external research to the questions that matter that investigate the nuances that matter. Yeah, something we used to do too is partner with ERGs within the organization mm -hmm. to kind of test our research with different audiences and different communities and. Um, see kind of how it resonated with them and what we were starting to learn. Jonathan. Yeah, I love this perspective, by the way, because we don't do enough of that internal um, sort of piloting, and so it's really interesting. I do think it raises for me, though, this idea of, like, how can we be more explicit about potential biases in that up front as well? Um, yeah. So we'd love to chat after about that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll, yeah, I think the, the tables that I was at, I think um, last thought I'll, I'll kind of raise is, like, I do think at least at, at table eight, there was a feeling of kind of a need for changing our, our sort of foundational belief system around this. And I wanna call, put Katie on the spot a bit um, around this notion, and I know citation pending on this quote, um, <laughs> from, but uh, that we should move away from uh, the attention economy to the intention economy. Um, I would love to hear kind of your thoughts around your experiences there and what that meant to you. Katie, oh yeah. Is Katie on? Oh, sorry. Well, this Katie. I was looking for you on that. I you moved. I moved. Well, Julie made me feel bad for not sitting in the middle, so I'm here now. Um, I'm, I'm right in the middle. Mission accomplished. Yes, you did it. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, a lot of the things that you all have said and others have said about change management um, absolutely believe that we can do all the research we want, but if we can't change people's minds, it won't necessarily matter. So the example I was talking about was working at Google and you know, in the dawn of the LLM age with GPT having been launched and being asked, well, do you, users really don't not want ads, right? I mean, like, that's not really, they really, they maybe they just don't know that they don't want ads. And we had research that was definitively saying that people love GPT because it gave them an answer without distraction, right? And um, what I was saying to the table is that for me, and not to beautifully segue into the orthodoxies mm. workshop Julie and I are about to run. In five minutes. <laughs> yes, but, that, but that, that is truly a reflection of an unwillingness to flip an orthodoxy, right? We believe that we can only make money by harvesting data and selling ads, and unless we are willing to challenge that orthodoxy and potentially flip it and imagine a world where we are an, in an intention economy, not an attention economy, and that's Chris Downs from Normally is responsible for that, it's not me. Um, so please don't attribute his brilliance to me at all, it's him. Um, but uh, it's true, right? And that's that's truly what it comes down to is being able to get people to question their belief systems that are that have served them very well for a very long period of time, potentially individually, financially served them well, and now need to be overturned. So yeah. 
Oh God, that is such a good segue. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh my gosh, it's Thanks, perfect. Jonathan, really we helps. actually just have, we, yeah. we just have a few minutes um, before we transition to our orthodoxies workshop and wrap up our day. Um, anybody on the panel have anything that they are holding on to that was part of the conversation that you wanted to share? Great. I have one more. Uh, I, right, we started this panel talking about impact and, and business measures and impact. And I, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nikki Smith in, in a minute, uh, but the, the importance of understanding the business perspective, right? And do you wanna, can you, can you add, she spoke so eloquently on this, I don't wanna steal her thunder. You are gracious to me. Thank you. Um, okay, so we talked about, yes, um, translating the researcher. So I, I've said this at another table, I think, earlier today. My research team, PhDers, very smart people, very rigorous in their practice. They care a lot about the way in which they conduct research, their methodology, how they articulate the findings. But not all the time do they have the business acumen and the some of the competencies needed to translate what's insightful to us as people who care about the actual work to what is meaningful to someone who has to do something with it and the implications of what that work means to the business. And so it's my job as the leader to do be that translator to then say Here's the insightful thing, and you need the context. You need the meat, but you have to say it in a way. You have to finesse it in a way that meets the need of here's what we're solving for. We're alleviating the pain points in these experiences. We're alleviating um, the, uh, the friction that consumers might feel when they go rent a car or employees might feel or all the things and, and we're showing them what that means from an experience metric standpoint. And so we're also tying numbers into our research as well and, and that comes with Qualtrics and a bunch of other systems that we kind of have been able to utilize. But really it's a matter of understanding the implications. What what problem are you solving and being able to articulate that in and you and saying, I'm giving you this evidence-based recommendation is what we're calling it. So then you know this is an opportunity. It solves for the pain. Here's the recommendation. Now go do. And we're tracking that through things like AHA, JIRA, all the stuff because we're we have such mm -hmm. close relationships with product and design. And I think that's something that's a benefit to us that maybe other people have not had the uh, privilege to experience. But yeah, that's awesome. And I, I the phrase that I use with my team a lot is we don't write book reports right. on my team, right? So you don't you don't just listen to the customer, write down the customer quote, and regurgitate the customer quote. I think there was somebody earlier in, in the audience, sorry, I didn't write your name down uh, during the panel discussion, who was asking about, uh, with strategic work, I feel like I'm starting to provide more and more of my own opinion, uh, and I'm worried about that, and I, I almost jumped out of my chair to say, no, like, do more of that. I, I, I really... Um, I push all of my folks as much as they can to provide their own opinion, and you should make it clear when it is your opinion. Uh, but I, I feel very strongly that if we as researchers or strategists, right, or strategic thought partners in the business are not providing our strategic thoughts and opinions, and what the hell value do we have? I, I really feel very strongly uh, about well, that. Well, and I know we need to wrap up, but I'm curious, Alba, because you n noted the importance of, you know, when we're talking to an audience, having someone that can relate to that audience be the one speaking to them. But I worry about when we get to the report out and decision-making space, that the voice of those people aren't in the room at that point. Maybe either of you have a thought on that of the, the audience that's being oh. talked about. So the someone that was a foster child or someone that really can relate to whatever. Oh, we don't have time for that yeah. for that question. That's the one that's not that. But, but I do actually want to, I, I love this distinction between making research insightful versus making research meaningful. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we uh, try to do a lot at Humanity Centered is when we're talking with executives, we're trying to recognize that they are people too. Yep. Right, And so when we are reporting back a research project or we're reporting back the findings of something or we're trying to share feedback that their employees have shared with us, it's really about trying to figure out what is the type of leadership 
that they're trying to occupy? Who are they trying to become? And how can our work help support that internal mission, not just the organization's mm -hmm. business goals, but really about how can I support my leadership, therefore show my value and impact by making them feel more secure in their own leadership? So I think we can be both strategic in terms of understanding the business, but also more strategic in understanding the leaders that we're reporting this to. Go read your quarterly financial reports. Yes. Uh, not a joke, like tomorrow, if you have not already and your company has quarterly financial reports, spend 30 minutes and read them. There's nothing that will be more useful to you uh, that I've said at all, so ignore everything else I've said previously. Go read your quarterly financial reports and understand why those things are important to your business. That is the most important thing you can do to build that connection with your business and understand how your work can make impact for the organization. Thank you. Yes, well, with that, we'll wrap up the share out. And I just want to, again, thank the panel um, for traveling from far and wide to be here and share your wisdom and spark conversations. We really appreciate you so much. Thank you. And I talked about earlier about the collective curiosity and creativity of this group. And as it always is the case when I get together with researchers and research leaders, I've been so impressed with both of those things that everybody has brought today, not to mention the energy. It's been a long day. So thank you for keeping up the energy and keeping the conversations going. Um, I hope that, you know, this, we are a group, uh, we talked a lot about researchers and strategi strategists and all. we're a group of leaders, right? We are here to help each other take our industry to the next level. Um, I was overwhelmed today with the sense of like, we can only take the first step in the journey here today. There is so much for us to talk about and learn from each other. So I'm really excited to keep the conversation going, to bring it to more people. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that with, with each and every one of you. Yeah.